So tell us uh, what you hope to do with this talk today. Yeah. So, you know, I was kind of unsure what everyone's experience was with social. So um, the presentation I kind of put together touches sort of the beginner level of social and then the more advanced parts of it kind of jumping back and forth. I was trying to get as much of it as I could into uh, one demonstration. But really, the, the, what my philosophy behind social media is, is that I think everybody can benefit from it. I think every business can benefit from it. Um, obviously, with getting customers as one way. But then, you know, even in one of our breakout groups, we were talking about the importance of PR and branding, right? Just because, you know, you may not be collecting customers from a social media account doesn't mean you can't be leaving an impression on people, right? You know, the things that are put on social last there for indefinitely, right? Unlike other kinds of ads where as soon as you stop paying for them, they get removed. With social, anything that's posted has that long-term indexing ability um, and social bookmarking. So the presentation kind of walks through how you can start doing that, how you can find customers. I have a section on, let me see, I can pull it up here. Uh, a section on different types of things you can get from social media users that you can use to grow your business. I'm gonna share some tools that I use to manage social because I'm sure a lot of us know that social is pretty complex. There are some really great tools out there for automating social, um, for seeing the analytics of social. That was one thing we talked about in our group too was how do you really see what you're getting out of social, right? How do you look at those numbers and decide that, yes, this is actually worthwhile, you know, to pursue. So I'm going to share some of those tools. Why don't, and then why don't you uh, um, share your screen and jump in? Yeah. Yeah. One sec here. Can you guys see it? Yep. Hit present. Yeah. Cool. You guys can see that? Looking good. Okay. I can't see the chat here. So I guess if there's any pressing question, John or somebody, if they want to chime, chime in, I can address it. Um, but I left some room for Q and A at the end too. So, so yeah, this is social media, uh, finding your customer, right? Getting more customers and building a community today, right? The, the main goal of social media from the standpoint of what businesses do for consumers is give them this platform where they can network with each other connect with each other, form these types of communities. So some big picture items. Uh, and again, this is if maybe you don't have a whole lot of social, you don't know what's going on with social. This is a report published at the end of 2019. There's about 3.5 billion active social media users, which is about 45% of the population. Of that 45%, 54% of them actively use social to research products or services. So there's 54% of that 3.5 billion that actually are out here looking for products or services or researching companies or engaging with businesses, right? Now with COVID-19, I think it's kind of a no brainer to us that there's more people using social now. So that 3.5 billion is potentially more. Um, this is a graph from CloudFront. They're a uh, content distribution network company. Oh, I think I can get that out of that view. And this graph, you know, because COVID is still happening right now, not a lot of these companies have these set metrics saying this is the increase we've, we've seen. This is the average because a lot of this is still fluctuating, right? But this um, graph shows internet speeds um, from this company and they, they serve 7 million properties. And we can see this upward trend of how long it takes for web pages, social media pages to load, which is inferring that there is a lot more activity on social above the 3.5 billion that we saw before. Facebook is sort of the, the, the pinnacle of social media. That's the, that's the platform that most people are familiar with because it's probably been around the longest, right? And they actually came out with a report that said every day they're seeing traffic as high as they see on New Year's Eve, as well as the Olympics during COVID-19. So that 3.5 billion is probably going up a little bit more, right? Now, on a daily basis, the question of how long do people spend on social? 
this is as of, you know, 2019 being the latest, 153 minutes per day. That's a little over two hours, right? That's already a lot of screen time. 3.5 billion spend just under or just over two hours browsing social media. Actually, it's probably just, a lot just under three. Mm -hmm. What's that? Just under three. Oh, under three hours. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's as of 2019. So we can infer that with the increase in COVID, there's a lot more people using it now. It's a lot of digital real estate and they're using it more actively. I mean, I personally, you know, have been using it more than I've ever used it because I'm at home. Right. So uh, I kind of talked about this uh, when John asked me, but just quick summary of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about the current nature of social media, how it's being used today, how the different communities engage on social, and how does that affect the way that we can engage customers? How can we find users on social knowing what people expect on the platforms? Uh, I'm going to go over some pros and cons. So how to use social media, um, how is it used by large companies? as well as small companies, and what are the pros and cons of the different tactics they take. So I have some screenshot examples of things that worked and things that didn't work so well for both um, large and small companies. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about three customer collectibles. Now this is something I actually wrote an article about and spoke about a few years ago, but I believe there's three things that customers can give to your business through social media. There's three types of, I'll call it information right now, but I'll break it down further later on. But there's three things that customers can give to your business. And if every one of your marketing endeavors targets one of these three, you can expect growth in terms of marketing and uh, engagement from users. So I'm gonna go into that more in depth later. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some tools for managing social media. It's a very complex animal, uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and there are some really great tools out there that can automate it. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, three strategies you can start doing right now to find your customers. So this is where I'll break into, you know, what do you do with the keywords? How can you filter the keywords out to really find the people that you're trying to reach or target, right? And I'll have three strategies that you can actually start doing. And then, I'll briefly talk about the future of social. So John has that doc he created, but if you guys have specific questions, um, feel free to write them down. We can go over them at the end or throughout the presentation. So here's me, here's a picture of me. Social media team at Amazon. Um, that's what I do for my day job. So in this role, I primarily uh, you know, oversee our forums, our Twitter page, our Facebook page, and really what we're providing is customer support. So my role with Amazon is I partner with marketing, I partner with people that are just tweeting at us, and I help solve their problems, basically, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I liaison with service teams. So if somebody has an issue with one particular service, they tweet at us and say, oh my God, I really hate that this happens every time I do this. It's my job to relay that information to that team that built that software or that piece of the infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned Alias. It's that app. It's a free download on the uh, App Store. It is currently iOS only. We're working on um, switching it over to other versions, but it is free if you guys want to pick that up. Um, I have a blog. It's called Millennial Moderator, and I really only put this in here because we leverage social media for all of our readers. So we get about 6,000 monthly readers, and we get all of our traffic from social media marketing. And I I have some pictures in the coming slides where I um, show the kind of posts that we make. SEO is the name of the game there, right? Search engine optimization. So I'll have some, some bits about that. And then that's my UW experience, which is whatever. And then I do some freelance social stuff. So social media users are smarter than people think. Again, there's a, such a wide variety of uh, experiences here in this room, I'm going to try to target all the different walks of it, right? So some people who use social all the time, maybe know that social media users are smart. You know, if you haven't used social or you haven't used the platform, maybe you haven't had that experience yet, but they are very smart social media users. I remember back in the day, and I'm not super old, but I remember back in the day when you could post a picture on Facebook and have 
a bunch of people like it, even people you didn't know, they would want to learn more about it. If you even provided a link to your business, they would click on it and they would, you know, want to learn more, maybe even buy the product, right? It's not that easy nowadays. And I think most of us can probably agree with that, right? Posting a photo will not yield sales on its own. The social media networks are designed to improve user experiences. They have these complex algorithms that try to give people the best experience possible, you know, and sometimes that backfires on them. Uh, like I think last year, Instagram rolled out this new algorithm that said they're going to show people the topics that they think they want to see first because they want them to have a better experience. But, you know, people didn't like that kind of control. They pushed back on it and, uh, it, it didn't come out to be what they intended it to be. Um, now, interestingly enough, even though they focus on user experience, most social media networks rely on business advertising as a serious revenue model. So this is a stat from uh, 2019. Um, Facebook made $69.6 .6 billion in ad revenues. So that's companies paying Facebook to boost their ads, which is like advertising, to more people. So it's a serious revenue stream. So these social platforms are kind of in a weird position where they're battling, you know, do we want to continue giving the users what they want or do we want to, you know, tap into more of the business dollars and give the businesses more leverage? Ultimately, I think the social networks are, are going to rely on what the users want. And users, again, are alert and aware of the advertising agendas and they get upset when it happens. So this is a, a comment screenshot I took of somebody who was on YouTube and they got positioned um, a, like a, a video that was promoted to them from some company and it showed up on their feed on their top feed for X number of days. And they got so upset because they saw it all the time. They went in and actually commented on the video, you know, what the comment says there, right? They, they watched it. Please stop putting it in my recommendation, right? Please stop telling me to watch this video. And 900 other, other people seem to agree with that. So in terms of qualified leads, it, this is not a qualified lead, right? There's no intent of this user actually going to that person's video because they want to watch it. They don't want to learn about the product. So not only is the company wasting its advertising money, but it's also ruining the user experience because now the user's just gotten, you know, pissed off about having this video shown up in their feed and 900 other people agreed with them. So that's kind of like, that kind of illustrates the, the interesting battle of these platforms, right? They want the users to have the best experience because they know the users are what drives their business, but they also depend on revenue from the businesses. This is another example I pulled from Twitter. Um, Homestuck is a company that provides, I think, home, um, like video games that you can play at home or something like that. And they said, hey, let's trend our hashtag, right? Because they had a very outward approach to their marketing. They said, hey, all of our followers, all of our people on Twitter, let's get our hashtag trending because they wanted to get more attention on the brand. And then this silly image here is just illustrating the fact that People are aware when brands do this, right? So navigating that those waters is really the tricky part of how to market on social, right? How do you get people to accept your marketing, but not in a way where it's overtly um, annoying or pushy or obvious, right? Like this one's very obvious. So some pros and cons of social. Um, again, kind of some big picture stuff, but I think it's important just to point these out. The ability to broadcast a message to millions of people. I think uh, even though you can't post a photo and expect everybody to, to go to your website and buy your product or service, the fact that they can find your post just by searching for it is, is, is massive marketing potential, right? If you put a billboard up in Seattle, no one's going to see it outside of Seattle unless somebody takes a picture of it or something, right? But in social, anybody can search for your account they can search for what you've said in the post and they can find your post. So that's a huge opportunity. Another opportunity uh, or, or another pro rather 
is the ability to create a communities of gurus and promoters without hiring staff. I think this is one of the um, best ways to use social to kind of start this traction of getting more customers to sign up for your product or service. Um, I put this example here, uh, DistroKid. It's a um, music distribution company. And so if you want your music to go on Spotify or iTunes, you go through this middleman, DistroKid, and they basically push it out to these platforms. So you sign up for DistroKid and they do all that back end work for you. Instead of paying for a team of staff, they've created a model of promotional codes um, for their users. So if you sign up for an account, you get this unique promo code. You can then post that code on your social or anywhere. It's just a link. And anybody who signs up with it gets 7% off their membership. And then the person that sends it gets a $5 bonus per sign up. And then of course the company makes its greater percentage of that sale. So without having to pay any staff for sales, even marketing, really, they don't really have a crazy marketing campaign. They're able to give their users the ability to become a guru or a promoter of their business and extend that benefit to other people. So that's another pro of social media. And then, like I mentioned, uh, that free long-term advertising, right? The indexing, social bookmarking, anything you post on social has the potential to be there forever which is a benefit. I'll just go through the cons real quick here too. Uh, like we saw in that YouTube comment, one negative opinion has the chance to turn off thousands. So with social, you know, having this ability to broadcast to millions is great, but it works inversely. If there's any kind of negative um, backlash, uh, it has the potential of escalating, right? To thousands, if not millions of people. And I have some examples of that, um, pictures that I'll show later and nothing is behind closed curtains. I, I remember um, in, I think in December, Elon Musk tweeted how much he thought the coronavirus was a joke. He was every day on Twitter saying, this is all propaganda, this is not bad, this is you know comical how people are freaking out about this. Which fast forward to today, obviously is not a very good impression, right? And now he's giving money to all these uh, you know charities and donating funds to those companies that are trying to produce the masks and ventilators and such. Um, and he deleted his original posts, but people took pictures of it. They saved it to their phones. And to this day, if you go in his comments, you can see people calling him out saying like, Oh, well you thought this. So, you know, what's changed kind of thing. So that's another con, right? Have that anything you put out there can be used against you sort of if you want to spend it that way. And then another, well, this one isn't too much of a con, but it takes commitment, right? Social media is complex. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, some of the tools I'll show you are uh, very useful, but there's a lot of moving parts to social and uh, it takes commitment to really see results. And then ultimately it follows mob mentality, right? If you have a few negative comments, people are more likely to side with those comments if they don't know much about your product or your service, um, if there's some good comments, people will more often than not side with those comments. So just keep that in mind when you use social. Um, are there any questions? Or John, do you want me to just keep going through this? Um, you're doing well. Um, Timothy said he didn't see that kind of indexing on Facebook posts. So probably wants to learn more about that. Otherwise, I think you're doing great. Okay. Yeah, I can't see the uh, Google Doc. Um, while I'm presenting, but I will write that down here. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll address that at the end too. Um, but some examples of pros. So uh, these are some screenshots I took of some social media accounts of larger companies, right? This is how large corporations use social media to push their brand, push their agenda to advertise to market, right? Ironically, I happened to just choose three food related companies. I don't know why, just maybe that's just the one I was hungry at the time. I don't know. <laughs> but um, as you can see, all of them are sort of pushing their agenda, right? Pushing their marketing agenda in a way that's not extremely overt, right? They're not out here saying, um, you know, let's trend our hashtag or um, click this link to purchase something, you know, click this link to sign up for our newsletter. They're playing with the community by engaging them in 
these three actually are humorous, right? These are the humorous types of posts. My favorite one, the Wendy's one on the right, I think is a great example of this. This is when they rolled out their four for $4 special, which nobody can obviously order, you know, Wendy's through social media. Uh, you can't like place an order. I, at least I don't think you can. Maybe now you can. You can I don't know. Um, or Uber Eats or something. But this is a great example where they said you have $4 to spend on the perfect lunch. None of the options obviously are equal to $4 except for the one that's the $4 for for $4. And that's when they rolled out their four for $4 special. And if you look at the statistics there, 51,000 likes, 10,000 retweets. So 51,000 people thought it was funny. 10,000 people retweeted it because they wanted to share it. And now X number of people know that Wendy's has this new special. So that's an example of good, uh, of the benefit of using it, um, of social media marketing. Some examples of cons, um, again, just to illustrate the other side of how this could, this could spin. Um, this McDonald's post here on the left was when they announced uh, their switch to the majority um, or all quarter pounder burgers at the majority of the restaurants will be cooked with fresh beef. And Wendy's, this is actually the official Wendy's account that came out and, and called them out on it, called out their campaign and said, so you're still using frozen beef in most of your burgers in all of the restaurants. And that had 71,000 people talking about it. The fact that what McDonald's said here implied that they're still using, you know, frozen beef in all of their restaurants. And I remember reading an article about this particular campaign. McDonald's had to spend a serious amount of money to fix this, to fix this PR crisis of people saying that, you know, their beef is still not, not fresh, right? So that's an example of how that wording in that original post was taken the wrong way and blown out of proportion. Now more people are focused on the negative side of it versus the good side of it. And then uh, this example here um, is from DiGiorno Pizza. I must have been really hungry when I made this, I, I swear. <laughs> um, but they use this hashtag, why I stayed, you had pizza. Uh, and that hashtag, if you look at the post below, is a hashtag used by people who are sharing their stories about why they stayed in domestic abuse related situations or um, relationships. So is it appropriate for DiGiorno Pizza to use that hashtag and try to be funny? Probably not, right? And here, this person, Scott Paul, is just one of many, you know, here's 514 people talking about this. He called it out and, call it exactly like it is. They don't understand the context. So that comment is probably getting more publicity than the DiGiorno pizza original tweet. And so that has a negative effect on the brand because then people think that the company is um, irresponsible, uh, they're insensitive. And a lot of what people think about these companies and brands will determine their buying behavior, right? Um, if, if I think I think we've all seen it, at least I have. I, I hope I speak for the majority of us where I say we've all seen PR related issues where people will not buy a product or vote for a candidate if they know they've done something or that didn't sit with their own moral code, right? This is that same example of that situation. And that's what can happen um, you know, if the social marketing aspect of it isn't crafted correctly. Okay, and then a couple, uh, just um, two examples uh, for social media for small companies. This Edge Body Boot Camp, um, they were a startup. They were doing a fitness camp. Um, and what they do is they celebrate their members. So if you have a product or service that maybe has already had a couple customers or some use cases from maybe your friends or family, a great opportunity is to share you know, what those customers are experiencing. Um, Obviously, uh, if it's like a physical location, like a boot camp, it would have been great to collect social media contacts before COVID, but uh, it's still not too late. You know, I think a lot of people nowadays have uh, some sort of software or a digital aspect to their business, to their product, and they can very easily share that uh, if they have some sort of user or some sort of consumer. Because what it does is it shows to the community, it shows on social media that people are using your service and they're getting some sort of value out of it. Um, and this is a picture of my blog. This is how we get all of our traffic. We post, you know, just the topic title. Um, if we have a guest writer, we feature them, a couple hashtags, which I'll talk about later. 
uh, and then just the link to the, um, to the, to the article and people click it. And, uh, you know, that's a very simple way to use it, especially for a blog. So if, if your business has a blogging aspect to it or any kind of easily consumable content, that's free, like reading material or video posting it is, 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 is fine. I mean, you, you know, you'll get some traffic from it if you use some hashtags and, and, uh, share it. Um, I want to talk about a few common social media terms. Cause again, I think there's a variety of experiences here with um, who has used social media. So it might be nice to clear these up. Engagement is any action performed on a post. So anytime somebody likes comments or shares that is measured as engagement trending. Trending is uh, basically social media platforms have an algorithm that detects mass attention to a particular subject in a short period of time. So on Twitter, for example, if, uh, I don't actually know what their threshold is, but if they, let's just say 5,000 people use the hashtag COVID-19 within a 24 hour time frame, that hashtag will become trending because 5,000 people have been talking about it. Uh, bounce rates. So um, bounce rates really important uh, for social as well as websites. So if you guys have websites, um, bounce rate is the percentage of single page visits. So if somebody goes to your, I'll, I'll, I'll just say a website in this case, if somebody goes to your website and they look at your homepage and then they leave without ever exploring other pages on your site, that single page visit is considered a bounce. So you want less of that, right? You want more people to actually learn more about your business, click on more of your links, go to the about section, go to the e-store, go to the features section, whatever. Um, you want a lower bounce rate. So bounce rate is that single page visit metric. Uh, conversion, uh, number of users who perform a directive action. So if you post a link, let's just say on, on Facebook, um, conversions is how many people actually click that link. So you could get 50 likes on the Facebook post, but only two people actually click the link and go to the website. So that's that conversion rate, right? How many people actually click through? Um, I was sharing in my, uh, in our breakout group just before this bitly. I don't know if anybody has used that here, B I T dot L Y. Um, it's a URL shortener, um, and you can use it to track con conversions. Um, you create your own URL for your website. And when somebody clicks it, it tracks that in the bitly system. So you can actually see from any site, right? You can use the same bitly URL on any website, social media, and anytime it's clicked, you can know how many times it's clicked. You get notified of it. Uh, reach and impressions. Um, these two are sometimes confused people. Um, reach means the number of times that unique people see your content. So if I post a picture on Twitter and let's just say John is scrolling through his Twitter feed and he sees my post and just keeps on scrolling, that would count as one unique person seeing my post. Now impressions, impressions is the number of times that post was shown in general. So if John sees my post and then refreshes his feed, goes back to the top and scrolls through it again, it would count as two impressions. So that's the number of times it was shown to people. Reach is the number of unique people that saw it. So that reach number would stay at one, but the impressions would go to two. So typically impressions are going to be a lot higher if you ever look at your um, social media analytics. That's why they're a lot higher up. This is a picture from um, the blog on Twitter. See, there's that impressions. It's a lot higher than anything else. Um, and that's because it's saying that, you know, this particular post or these posts have shown up 9,126 times uh, in the past 28 days. So hopefully that helps a little bit, uh, clarification wise. Um, I won't, let me talk about these customer collectibles. So I think this is where we can really start getting into the action items for what you can start using in your um, social media um, posts. Um, because these three customer collectibles, uh, from my experience, are um, collectively exhaustive, right? So these customer collectibles collect the three types of things from customers or users on social that uh, kind of encompass everything you can get from them. Um, let me explain it more as I go through it. So um, the first thing you can get from customers on social uh, is their trust, right? 
Uh, this is the least intrusive type of collectible you can receive from a customer because trust, really the goal of it is to get customers curious. The goal of trust is to get users on social to trust that what you're saying or what you're posting about or what industry you're in, you know what you're talking about, right? You're not here to scam. You actually, you know, you care about the industry. You care about what you're doing and they can see it. That's how you're in their trust. Yeah, in the next few slides, I'll actually show some strategies for collecting that. But in general, uh, just overview, this is, uh, you know, the goal is to get the customers curious. The second is customer information. Now, this is a little more intrusive, right? Because instead of just having the customers view your social accounts, view your posts and believe in what you're doing, now you're gathering information from them, right? So you're asking them for their email address, for their phone number. And most commonly what you'll see is that these are collected in exchange for things like a free trial or some sort of a coupon, right? For using a product or service. Um, enter your email and you'll get 25% off your first purchase kind of thing. Right. Um, and the goal here is really to get customers committed because at, at this collectible, you're actually gathering something from the customer, something that they, you know, that is personal to them, right? The first one trust is just getting them to be on your side. This one is for them to actually show some commitment to whatever it is you're doing. And then the Holy grail, right? Customer payment. This is when customers have given you their trust. They trust you. They've given you some sort of information and now they actually want to purchase from you. And I'll show you some examples of how you can funnel those types of um, collectibles on, on social platforms. But um, my belief is that these three uh, types of collectibles, uh, if every single post you make on social targets at least one of these, you're growing your overall uh, marketing um, on social and your overall perception of your brand as well as leading them towards the process of making purchases and actually becoming customers right so let me show you some examples here so these are things you can start doing right now to get those kind of uh these kind of reactions from your users um for customer trust inside looks into your product or your process i think most people here they've started their business because they believe in what they're doing they have a backstory into, you know, I was having this problem and I fixed it and now I want to sell this solution to other people or I found a community who needed this and I built it and now I'm going to sell it to other communities. You know, what's that story that makes you stand out from your competitors? Um, that's the first way you can really develop trust with your, with your potential social media customers. Um, community questions and engagements, becoming a thought leader. Um, going back to that earlier slide about, uh, you know, how social media users are conscious of marketing agendas, it's, it's, it works better. It's more beneficial to businesses to step in and become a leader in their niche, um, to become somebody that people can turn to for advice about a particular topic. I mean, that's how you show, that's how you build that trust with the customer, right? Is showing them that you know why your solution is the best solution or why they need to care about this, right? Um, so I got, I have two pictures here um, from Instagram um, of two different accounts. This first one, Vegan Health Hub, they are a, um, uh, they publish recipes, I believe, uh, or they sell like recipe cookbooks for vegan meals. Um, obviously with bookstores being closed, they can no longer rely on that but they're stepping up and becoming a thought leader in their in their topic right vegan health healthy activities and they've come up with these at home activities people can do to stay healthy and productive right so they're becoming a thought leader and building trust with their users by saying hey look we understand you're trapped at home um so are we here are some things you can start doing to get healthy right kind of meeting them at that point of connection where they're where they're connecting with them and saying we're also stuck at home let's work together on you know in this case getting healthy and and staying active uh this one from nestle uh was kind of the same thing it's that commitment right it's becoming a thought leader uh where they're saying in 2018 we committed that 100 percent of our packaging will be recyclable or reusable by 2025 so sharing that inside story of what their commitments are what their goals are for the company and for the planet is one way to establish that trust. So if you have anything like that for your startup, 
creating that kind of content for social will help people understand what you're doing and where you're coming from and, and earn their trust. Customer information. So like I mentioned, this is gonna be the uh, kind of starting to gather actual information from customers, getting that email address for the free trial, right? Getting their phone number so that you can give them a coupon code. Uh, I think we've all probably seen um, things like this pop up on websites, you know, free 10% off coupon uh, to, to, uh, to, get a, to get a discount, right? Um, this is a really interesting example of it that I wanted to talk about. Um, this is Cash App. I don't know if anybody has used Cash App. It's, um, it's an app you can use to send money between people, kind of like Venmo. Um, yeah, but they do this thing called Cash App Friday, which is right here. You can see the hashtag. Uh, and on Fridays, they give away $100,000 to people who retweet this post with their cash tag, which is like their username on their app for a chance to receive $250 and you know, must be following this account to qualify. So my original question for this post was, I mean, my first thought was, wow, that's crazy. It's a lot of money to be giving away, but what are they getting from this, right? 6.7 million views, 88,000 likes, 75,000 retweets, 157,000 comments. What I believe they're getting from this is, um, really this this right here this username because what they're saying is we're giving away money who doesn't like free money right everybody in exchange for giving away this money we want you to send us your username because if we're going to send you money you have to be on our app right so what they're having people do in addition to follow them retweet it for that viral aspect is they're having people join their platform and send them their username to verify that they're on it and in turn, they're getting X number of users. So they're increasing their user base through this, right? And we can infer with 157,000 comments, a good percentage of those are people that probably are signing up just because of this post, right? Now, the question of did they actually give away $100,000? Hard to tell, honestly. You can go through the comments and they post some screenshots, but they never equal the full amount we can assume positive intent that they did give away all of that. But the, the, the main takeaway that I'm sharing here is that they're getting this unique bit of customer information, this username, because they're trying to get their users just to sign up for the app. And then retweeting it and commenting and following is just adding engagement. So it creates this kind of trickle down effect of, you know, they retweeted it 75,000 times. How many of those people then also retweeted that other person's post, right? And it, it kind of cascades down. So they could have gotten a very serious, you know, large amount of, of um, account users from this. Now, I'm not saying giving away money is the solution, but in this case with Cash App, they may have it. They used it to their benefit. So that's an example of that. And then um, I want to talk about how to set up payments um, on social, how to, you know, request payments from customers on social. Going off of these three collectibles, right? The trust, the information, and the payment. Payments like the holy grail. If you have their trust, if you have some information from the customers, typically they're going to be much more inclined to pay for your services, right? Because they've already, um, they trust you. They've given you their information uh, to get some sort of free trial or something. Now they're, you know, going to be more inclined to pay versus a, somebody who may just come across your, you know, website for the first time. So I'll just throw up these pictures here. Uh, there's two main ways to really direct payments on social. Um, the first is through direct URLs to purchase products within, you know, your page biographies and within buttons. Uh, in our breakout group earlier, we were talking about how do you get Instagram uh, links? How do you put a link in Instagram to have people purchase? Because, you know, you can't put a direct URL that's hyperlinked in the caption. You can't put it in a comment. It has to go in the bio typically. But, you know, Instagram now being owned by Facebook and still wanting to make revenue from businesses um, has this new feature for uh, accounts that I think are over 10,000 followers. I believe that's the number um, where you can actually, uh, and I know it's a little small here, maybe I can zoom in on it, um, where you can embed these pop-ups on the actual Instagram post for people to click. Uh, and when you click on it, it takes you to the product and you can purchase it right from Instagram. 
right? So if you are at that level, um, which some people may be, some may not be, that's an option. But if not, you can absolutely still put the link in the bio, um, which is like the biography section of Instagram where you can put your website or whatever you want it to be. And then this example here is from this uh, pizza company. Uh, you know, Facebook is really great for businesses because it gives you a ton of flexibility with creating buttons to uh, direct customers straight to your payments. So pizza, a pizza company wants you to start an order. They want you to start building your pizza and then you'll pay for it. But you can make this button, like for our app, Alias, our um, Facebook page has a download app button. All you do is click it, it takes you straight to the app store and it gets you to download the app. So um, I would suggest going through your Facebook page if you have one and looking at what your options are and seeing what makes the most sense. Um, it doesn't hurt to have this set up. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I wanna talk about some tools for managing social, just some overview stuff again of which tools you can use to automate the processes, uh, which are most effective for what. Hootsuite's the first one. Um, Here's a picture of Hootsuite. It looks kind of complex. I don't know if anybody here has worked with it or not. Maybe some have, some haven't. But really what you're looking at is different columns of feeds. And with this tool, you can schedule posts. So if you want to say you want to post a link to your newsletter on Wednesday, you can schedule it in here and then Hootsuite will automatically publish that post on your behalf on Wednesday. So you don't have to actually be there. So what I do for my blog is every Sunday, I go through and schedule the entire week's worth of posts. And I say, Monday, at this time, I want this to be published. Monday, this time, I want this to be published. Uh, I want a picture here. I want a video here. I want a link here. And I create that narrative in advance. So then all I have to do is push play, and it plays out throughout the week. Um, and Hootsuite does have a free version. It also has a paid version for uh, different features. I just use the free one. It works just fine. You can get started with it today. Um, some of you may already use it or you may prefer some of the alternatives like Sprout Social, for example. TweetDeck is another one. TweetDeck is Twitter's version of Hootsuite. It lets you automate your tweets. Uh, you can create keyword alerts. You can search um, using a variety of operators to filter your searches. So it looks kind of like Hootsuite where you have these columns. But the real power of TweetDeck is that you can search um, for people talking about subjects with parameters around their location, for example. So if I want to learn, um, if I want to find people that are using the word virtual reality in within 10 miles of Seattle, I can go in TweetDeck and I can put in these hashtags um, and these uh, operators like or to filter the results. And then I will get a list of everybody in the past 24 hours. You can search it by, you know, a month, a year, whatever, and get those people. And uh, from there, engage with them, follow them, see what they're talking about, um, etc. I'll have some, um, some more examples of this in the upcoming slides. Uh, Sprinkler is another great tool. This is more of an enterprise level software. Um, I don't know how many people here would be at that level. We use it for Amazon. So this lets you create user accounts for managing social. So if you want, if you have a team of like 10 people that manage your social media and you want five of them to have access only to one account, five to another, five of them, you know, a few of them only to be able to like posts on your behalf, you can set those permissions here. So a little more on the enterprise side, but still um, a useful tool if you're at that level. And then I wanted to share the Facebook and Instagram automatic scheduler tools or automatic responders. I don't know if you guys have played around with this, but Facebook and Instagram allow you to create these sort of chatbots, which is like if you've ever called a bank, they say if you want to speak with a representative, push one. If you want to know business hours, press two. It creates kind of like that do your own adventure type of um, scenario. Uh, with Facebook and Instagram, you can do that in your messages. And it's great to set this up, even if you don't have a whole lot of traffic yet, because when you do get some traffic, it's good to have kind of a consistent model for people to get funneled to the right places. It's a, it's a, it really what it is, is it's saving time. It's automating that process. So you don't have to go in there and reply to every single person manually. I get it if you want to, but you can also, um, people are used to this. People are used to having these types of automatic um, responders and chatbots. So take a look at it. That's totally integrated into the Facebook platform. 
Um, if you go to your Facebook page and then settings, there's actually, you can't see it here, but on the left side, there's an option for message responses, I think is what it's called. And I can help anybody through that if they have questions afterwards. And then get someone to do it. Here's another picture of me just saying that, you know, social is complex. There is value in it, but it, you know, if you're at that point where you're not sure how to do it, having somebody help you do it is a great start. Okay. And then this is kind of the last section. I, I hope John, I'm not taking up too much time here. There's uh, I just want to share three strategies you can use right now to start finding your customer on social. The first one is keywords, right? And I think keywords is something most of us have experience with finding those keywords, but I want to share some strategies to how to um, find the right keywords, right? How to find those keywords that are uh, the most effective for potentially becoming customers or at least learning more about the community and the, and the, and the, um, the community around that niche, right? So I'll just throw this up here. I use a tool called Surfer. Uh, it's a free um, browser extension plugin. And I hope you can see it. Let me zoom in. What you can do with it is you search for keywords and it gives you this um, number of searches per month that occur for these keywords. So with virtual reality, 74,000 searches per month in the US, 121.9 thousand uh, globally happen for it. And on the right, it actually suggests similar keywords. So you can see that people who search for this have also been searching for similar keywords that are these. And you can also see the search volumes and similarity for how closely it relates to, to this topic. And this is a free plugin. Uh, it does have a paid version, um, but I've been using the free version. It works great. So what I suggest is, uh, you know, going through this and plugging in the keywords that are most applicable to your business. Um, think big picture, right? Like this would be virtual reality would be if I was helping a um, virtual reality company who maybe either makes games in virtual reality or um, creates some sort of um, marketing data analysis software system, I would start with big picture keywords like this. You want to have, uh, you want to target keywords that have low competition, but high search count. Um, because these keywords, what that means is there's not a whole lot of other people targeting those keywords, but there's a high amount of people searching for it. Medium to high is what I look for. Um, the best tool for finding that in my opinion, in my experience, is Google Keyword Planner. I don't think I put a picture of it, no. Um, Google Keyword Planner. It's part of the Google um, Business Suite. It's totally free. You just have to sign up for a Google Business account. But with it, when you search keywords up, you can actually see what the competition is for keywords, and you can filter it over the past day, month, year, five years, whatever. And you can see the average search volume. So Good keyword to target, again, would be something that has low competition, not a whole lot of other people talking about it, but it's having an increase in people searching for it because that infers that there's interest, but not a whole lot of people talking about the topic. This is uh, another um, strategy for keywords. This is from TweetDeck, which is one of those tools I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a list of their operators. So this is how you can filter your searches through TweetDeck. And this is actually on their website. So if you just go to TweetDeck, um, I think it's just TweetDeck.com, they have a doc section and you can find these operators listed there. But this lets you narrow down your keyword searches on Twitter specifically to find, you know, those individuals that are within X, uh, like this one right here, right? Within 15 miles of New York City, you would put this operator into your TweetDeck search. Or you can find tweets that contain either this word or this word. Uh, you can also do and, right, or, or exact phrases. So using this is a great way to filter those keywords in Twitter. So that's the first uh, strategy that I would suggest is going through and really researching your keywords. Uh, the second strategy for social, um, engaging communities, uh, specifically complement, complementary communities, um, communities that uh, complement your business in some way. Um, I'll give you an example with Alias, our um, digital portfolio business card app. Um, we've been targeting forums of freelance photographers as one group, right? Because we've um, built the assumption that freelance photographers are people that would want to create online portfolios of their work. So we go to these communities and we find them on Facebook groups. We search for them. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, Reddit is a great example for where you can find these communities too. I'm not sure if many people here are familiar with Reddit. It's basically a forums homepage and you can find pretty much any topic um, and find the community about that topic there and uh, engage with them. So finding the forums, uh, finding the groups and uh, talking with them. So this is an example. I've been assisting somebody with a uh, virtual reality related um, software. And what I did was I went to this community, which is this Oculus Quest that you see here. That's the name of the community. So it's a community of people that own this particular piece of hardware. And I went in here and I asked them questions. I asked them questions about what they thought about this particular service, if they would find value in it, you know, if they, um, if they would ever use this, if they know somebody that would want to use it. And I had a lot of comments. This is just one example, right? Somebody saying they don't, you know, they're not the target market for this, but they do see value and don't think it's too early, right? Because I asked them if it was too early to engage this. Getting any kind of feedback from these communities is, is crucial and so powerful through social because you get user feedback. I mean, the reason I engaged a, a forum of this um, hardware, like these users, is because I wanted to know what their experiences were like. Like they've been using this gear for so long. Here we're coming up with this new idea for how they can use it, how, um, you know, even though the majority of these members might be gamers, what about the UI experience? You know, how can we improve the UI? You guys know UI better than anyone else, right? Because you that, that's where you live. That's the world for you. So finding these communities on Reddit, just even doing a Google search, you know, I would say meetups.com even has some really great uh, groups around different, you know, topics go into there and, and become that thought leader, earn that trust of them. Um, and, and uh, you know, they'll eventually become your customers or you'll learn something that you can use to improve your business. And then this, this one is a little more of the guerrilla marketing side of things. Um, I'm kind of an aggressive marketing person sometimes. And um, I like to engage competitor communities. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Linktree, which is one of our kind of one of our competitors for alias. Um, they had downtime, their servers went down and there were dozens of people on Twitter complaining in this account and saying, Oh, can you guys still hear me? John, can you hear me? Yes, you're doing fine. Oh, okay. I had to take out my AirPod cause the battery died or the charge died. Um, but, uh, with Linktree, we engaged their competitor community and said, Hey, you know, I'm sorry that you're having this issue. Why don't you try our service instead? And of course, we didn't come across it in a way that's, that was harmful. We didn't slander the brand or anything. Um, we, and, and we weren't the only ones doing this, actually. There's a lot, there were a lot of other people, other companies trying it. But uh, that's another way that you can engage communities to get, you know, in, traction and engagement for your brand is uh, look, at, look at those competitors. Look at what the competitor communities are talking about, right? see what their users are having problems with. What are they enjoying? Uh, learn from those um, communities, right? Especially if your product or service is very closely related to someone else's, like it's almost the same thing. You know, going to John's point, if you guys have been to any of John's, um, you know, lectures, it's always about solving the problem, right? Are these people in other communities having problems with that competitor? And can you solve them with your business, right? And you can learn that by going to the, those um, communities on, on social. Here's a screenshot of uh, one of those users, you know, they're saying they're having this issue, tag Linktree and there's us coming in, hurrah, try out Alias. Thanks, I'll look into it. And, uh, you know, we were able to get some users from that. Uh, and then the last strategy I want to share is uh, partnerships. So some people here may have experience with affiliate marketing. Um, this is kind of in that same category, right? Um, partnering with complementary businesses, um, collaborating on giveaways, turning their followers, their customers onto you. I think I have a picture here. So this is a, 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 I thought this was a really strange kind of thing for this Twitter philanthropist to do, but he partnered with Jeffree Star, who is like a celebrity singer, whoever, whatever else. There's a lot of things going on with Jeffree Star, but they partnered with him to give away $30,000 to one random person who followed his account and Jeffree Star's account and retweeted it, right? So this person, 
you know, from what it appears to be, reached out to this person and formed this collaboration saying, I want to give away 30 grand, but you know, I don't have the biggest network. You have a network. How about I empower you to give this away in exchange for, you know, in this case, following this account, but it could be, it could be a, a newsletter sign up, right? This account, you know, Jeffree Star could say, I'm giving away 30 grand to one person who retweets, follows and subscribes for this newsletter. Right. And, you know, obviously for a startup, maybe jumping up this high may not be feasible. Um, but, you know, find other companies that could complement your services on social and partner with them and see if they'd want to do a giveaway, a free month membership. Um, or, you know, uh, one thing we do with the blog is we write articles about other businesses and then they post that review um, article on their social media and we post it on ours, obviously. So then our readers learn about the business and then the business followers get a chance to experience our blog. And if they like the content, they follow it, right? So um, look for those opportunities, uh, influencer marketing, endorsements, affiliate marketing. Really the value here is that people trust these brands, right? People trust Jeffree Star more or less. They engage with the content. They like what they post and uh, you know, you can use that to your benefit. Um, there is a website here. This is a screenshot of it. I should have put the text in, but it's called flanks.com, P-H-L-A-N-X.com. And it is a marketing collaboration uh, website where uh, various types of online businesses, accounts can go in and request collaboration from other influencers or other brands to work with them. So sometimes, you know, you'll have a brand or a company in here that says we are looking for, you know, some sort of influencer to post uh, a picture of our product and leave a review and we're willing to pay you $300 for it, right? Or sometimes it could be a direct, uh, direct collaboration. It could be like you do this and we do that kind of thing. Um, so check that out, flanks.com. Uh, there's a collaboration tab in there where you can go in and see all the posts and they get updated pretty frequently. I've actually seen an increase in number of posts because of the COVID stuff. So there's more people trying to take advantage of this now. So now would be a good time to get in there. Um, the real question of, uh, and this is the question that most people have when it comes to influencer marketing is how do you really quantify the conversions, right? How do you feel confident that this is actually going to convert into whatever you want it to convert to sales or signups or followers, whatever. Flanks has this, uh, this tool called an engagement rating calculator, which is really useful. It's free. Um, I think you, I think it limits you to like 10 searches per day or something like that for the free version. But, um, you can use this to, and this is the Instagram version, but they have a Facebook and Twitter one as well. And you can search up accounts and you can find what their engagement rating is. And that tells you, um, based on the number of followers, right? 133 million followers for national geographic on average, they get 0.16% engagement. And that comes out to 225,000 likes per post and 670 comments. Now that may seem low, but think about it as it scales, right? It's a scaling factor. If you have an account with 10 followers and all 10 people like it and all 10 people comment, your engagement rate's gonna be 100%, right? But you know, here, 0.16 comes out to 670 comments. So it scales as you go up with the number of followers. And on the right, um, I just pulled some other celebrity type of uh, account searches just to give you context. So like Kylie Jenner, 4.57%, that is considered a high engagement rating for somebody with that number of followers. And I don't have that um, number here, but it, it is quite up there. It's a lot of followers, right? So you can use this tool. It's free. I would suggest using this to qualify uh, any influencers you want to work with. Um, or any brands that you want to partner with, this will give you an idea of what kind of return you can expect on uh, working with them for engagement. And then quickly, I uh, just want to talk about the future of social. You know, where is it going? Um, hopefully those last three slides gave you some insight into what you can start doing now. Video content continues to be king. Um, this is a, a, a screenshot from Sprout Social. They're one of the um, social media managing platforms I mentioned earlier briefly. Um, video continues to be the preferred method or for mo most transparent type of social media posts. I don't know if you've seen in the news recently, but Quibi, 
um, just launched. They are a, they're basically Netflix, but they're on your phone and they create, uh, they let you watch short videos on your phone. So um, in, in my opinion, the future of social is going to continue seeing more video content. Um, I do think that transparency and personality of business continues to be important. Like we saw at the beginning, brands that are too heavy or too aggressive with their advertising agendas are going to have backlash um, from, com from consumers. Um, in those examples of like the Wendy's four for four that I shared, I think that's a great example of them being funny and personable, having personality on social and still pushing their agenda. So be mindful of that. So conclusion, uh, social is important, right? We talked about the nature of social, um, what it's being used for nowadays, what flies and what doesn't. So staying clear of those cons, uh, while targeting those pro benefits, right. That we talked about. Um, how is it used? We saw the examples of the large companies, small companies, some tools and mechanisms for managing social. Um, I shared a couple images of that. Those three collectibles, the three things you can start gathering from customers today on social. Hopefully that was uh, insightful, helpful. Where is social going? And then we talked about those uh, you know, strategies to starting to find the customers, the keyword searches with those tools like Surfer, engaging communities, and then working with partners to uh, you know, get their followers and their community to learn more about you. Here's some stuff about me, if anybody cares. My website, um, this is our, the Alias app. Uh, this is like the portfolio page I've created for myself. I'll drop that link in the chat afterwards and you guys can check it out. I'm gonna put a link to the article about these collectibles that I wrote in the chat as well, um, just so you can read it on your own time. I know that this part may have been a little confusing for some people, but uh, I'll put that link in there for, for you guys if you want to read it. And yeah, let me turn off this video here. I hope I did not bore you guys. That was a long talk. Uh, how do I exit this? Okay. Cool. Well, we, well, we lost four people, not too bad. Um, actually six, but that's all right. Oh. We're doing good. Um, although we probably don't have a lot of room for um, questions, uh, maybe we can do a couple of questions. And then I put into the chat a link to the Seattle Startups Open Coffee, as well as into the document. So maybe we can have an ongoing conversation about the questions that are asynchronous, if that would work. I, I also put a... Um um, I created a short survey if anybody, um, it's, it's optional, but just feedback from me about the presentation. I just put it in the chat. If you want to fill it out, it just asks like, you know, if I was talking too fast, too slow, if the content was meaningful. And then um, there's an optional section to put in an email address if you want to uh, be notified of any future talks um, that I may be doing. So totally optional, but I appreciate the feedback if anybody gives it. <coughs> Does anybody have an uh, important question they want to ask now? Remember, you're all on mute. If the website is not done yet, and, but I want to start engaging um, audience and start getting followers and stuff, is it a dangerous move? Because when people are seeing those content, but they can't really get to my webpage and actually find stuff. Not necessarily. I, um, I've worked with a lot of accounts that um, did not have a website for a long time. They just relied on social media to build that community. I would say that if you don't have the site yet, I just probably wouldn't link it in the, in the social pages yet. I would wait for it to be done. But you can still absolutely use social now to get your message across, right? Um, through posting pictures, videos, and engaging those communities too. Finding those people and talking to them, tweeting at them commenting on their posts. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I put into the document uh, a link to the Slack channel uh, invite. So if you want to join the Slack channel, we can go. Let me suggest, Alex, that you set up a channel in the startup Slack about social media marketing. Um, and then answer the questions in there if people start asking a bunch. Um, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to do this again with some other topics as we get speakers gathered. So the Seattle yeah. Angel uh, 
um, meetup group is where we'll announce them. Um, and then don't forget that we do open coffee every Tuesday morning at 830 um, at the Seattle Startups Open Coffee Meetup Group. Thanks very much. See you guys later.